All right, guys, welcome back to The Rake. Um, we have a special guest this week, Jesse Sylvia. Um, he lives about 10 seconds from my house, so that that was part of the reason that we wanted to have him on, um, so we could talk about our dogs and stuff like that. But uh, also, he started a stable of coaching and training um, during the coronavirus, and we wanted to talk to him about that as well. How's it going, Jesse? It's great, Jamie. How are you? Great. <laughs> <laughs> And how's Marley? Marley, you're at like I'm you're ready to wrap your day up. I'm what? I said you're about wrapping your day up and we're just like starting ours. I know. I'm good. Yeah. I've been kind of getting up late. I've been getting up at like 1 p.m. So I'll be up for another good five hours probably. But gotcha. yeah. Cool. So uh so we can't just completely ignore the the drama of the week for poker since it started out, everyone was kind of glued to Twitter for a few hours before. Perkins decided to just go to sleep for the night. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's let's get Jesse's thoughts on the Jungle Man ghosting scandal. <laughs> Great. <laughs> no pressure. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think Haralabo summed it up. Haralabo summed it up best. He's just like, no, why has it got to be Jungle? <laughs> I mean, I feel that whenever there's a scandal and we don't know who it is yet, everyone has someone in mind. They're like, I hope it's that guy. And yeah, it's yeah. never Jungle. Jungle's never the guy that you're like, yeah, I hope it's that guy. The thing about Jungle is like, for most people, like you, you might get more like upset about it or whatever with Jungle. You could just imagine somebody framing ghosting in a way that like doesn't make it sound as bad. And then jungle being like, well, yeah, I guess from that point of view, it kind of makes sense. You should be doing it. (laughs) Right. Or if you're just like, Hey man, we'll give you unlimited ice cream. If you just ghost." and he'd be like, okay. And then you're like, all right, (laughs) that just sounded like a good transaction to him. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, all that ice cream was going to melt otherwise. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But there was like, there was a scandal similar in the past with jungle, right? What was the guy's name? His dog is head. Hasib, uh, I never remember the person's name, but if you go through the archives in two plus two, you can read all about a similar ghosting scandal. Um, I don't even know anything about that. What do you right? know? That's how we like sweep things under the rug in poker. And I really wish that we didn't because then it would never happen again. If people just remembered all the scandals of the past. So there's very, something very specific about why you don't know that too. He has actually made tons and tons of money in tech, I believe. But uh, he has scrubbed every bit of that from the internet, except for the two plus two thread where it came from. Like any articles that I guess he messaged like poker news and different people who wrote articles and had them remove the articles and stuff. So he's done a very good job of making that less known. Isn't it crazy? Like, why do people remove the articles though? Just because he asked nicely or what? Like, did he pay them to remove them? Because they're, you know, there's nothing illegal. There's no legal ramifications of writing an article based on truth. So any threats or anything, you could just ignore them if you know that the, that the subject matter is true. So then yeah. I don't understand that unless people got paid to take them down. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know the answer. That's, I'd like to know the answer. I, I don't think um, I thought about it enough to think about whether it was worth my time to call up Poker News and ask them why they took it down. And yeah. It was about All as right. far as maybe, point, <laughs> maybe that'll be the next scandal. We'll be like, why are you hiding the truth? We'll go after like Chad Holloway. you know what i was reading some like hilarious uh crypto tweets today and i realized that the poker world that's not involved in crypto would just absolutely love crypto because the the scandals are way more wild and like the villains are way more evil and Mm -hmm. ridiculous and comical and the whole thing is just great like people like hacking people's wallets or what happens uh no it was like craig wright doing craig wright things um, I don't know if you know Craig Wright. He, he's like claiming to be the guy who created Bitcoin, um, who's an anonymous person or group or whatever. Um, and he's basically didn't create Bitcoin. It's like pretty clear. And he keeps trying to take it to like different courts in Europe and um, prove that he is this person, but he has no proof. So um, he keeps looking. Yeah, there's been amazing scandals. Like when when I was working with Doug Polk on the crypto channel, um, we uncovered the BitConnect scandal or like brought it to light oh, yeah, before it all came crashing down. That it was, was great. awesome. 
because that was like going after actual villains like in poker we're like okay like the villains are somewhat comical uh with bitconnect like these people are stealing millions of dollars and there are people shilling for bitconnect that were helping these people like fleece other people out of money it was actually like a crazy ponzi scheme type thing but like that was even more comical than anything in poker too because do you remember the uh the bitconnect guy yeah bitconnect <laughs> and he dances like, across there's the nothing street. like that guy we don't have a guy like that no i mean jungle is close but jungle yeah but what do you think of the actual scandal though like because i i was thinking about it and look it is stealing because like nobody none of those guys like all the rec players that are in that um app none of them are willingly playing jungle man and also, Jungle Man might know stuff about them and their style of play, and those people don't even know they're playing Jungle Man. So he's not only better than all of them, but he also has an advantage of knowing their playing style, and these people think they're playing against another whale. So, like, isn't this, like, I, I don't you feel like it should be slightly more scandalous than, than it is right now? Oh, yeah, it's, like, super uncool. It's uncool, yeah. <laughs> I think the problem is like he compared it to Possel right at the gate and then he kind of like shoot himself in the foot a little bit because now people are just comparing it to, I don't know. Yeah. But. I feel you. I think that's a good way to minimize it. If I'm ever involved in a massive scandal, I'm going to be like, guys, this is so much worse than Watergate. And then when it comes out that it's just like some random like small time scandal, people will ignore it. I think it's a good, good, good strategy. The thing is, is like that, that's kind of the Trump defense, by the way. I mean, he just like everything that he does, like people are like, we got him now. And he's like, no, nah, it's not a big deal. And then they're like, shit, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and like, whether it is a big deal or not, like he seems to get away with that a lot, which is pretty, yeah, very um, like Roadrunner-esque. Where like, you think you got him and then he sneaks away. He's I'm not, not endorsing him in any way. <laughs> are there more, so this confirmed more people like big name pros, right? Yeah, actually, I was going to say, like, I think we shouldn't talk about it like, is it cool or isn't it cool that Jungle did this? Because really, we have one tweet from Dan Bilzerian as evidence, which is like, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think Dan has reason to lie, but that's probably not a lot of evidence. Yeah, exactly. Like, we're basically just talking in allegations right now. And unless um, Bill or Dan Bilzerian comes out with hard evidence, then I guess, yeah, it really isn't something that we can say for sure yet. Mm. Um, I don't know. And also the way that Perkins said at first, you're right, that it sounded like it was multiple people doing this. Um, so that would kind of suck too for Jungle if it's like, yeah, all these people are doing it and then Jungle is the only one who takes the blame for everyone. Um, so it would be interesting to see like what pans out from this. But I think like the point that Bill is trying to make about the Postle thing, I was like, I just don't think it's even close because yeah, the money was, it was way bigger, but probably relative to how much people care about the money, it wasn't. Like someone who's playing on a stone stream that buys in for five hundred or a thousand dollars, that's probably more of their bankroll percentage wise than the people playing on this app, like who probably have life rolls of like millions of dollars. Yeah, hard to say. Um, what else was I gonna ask? Oh, I mean, do you think this is gonna be like an ongoing problem, Jesse, with like more of these unregulated apps coming up and there's just so much <laughs> there's just so much that can go wrong. I mean, I don't know. I think it's been a problem too. Like yeah. Uh, it's already been there. It's just, you know, Bill wasn't aware of it probably when he, you know, originally announced this was this massive thing. I mean, it was a big scan. Like yeah. what happened is not cool and it's a big deal, but like he just wasn't aware of how frequently it probably does happen on these apps already. So yeah. like that made the whole situation more comical, I guess. But like, yeah, uh, it still sucks and it's not cool at all or anything like that. Uh, but I mean, like Joey posted a video like a week and a half ago. that was like, it was like some, some room in China and there's like 20 people on these apps and they're like clearly playing like four accounts on the same table or whatever. <laughs> like this think, is. Yeah. One of the problems is that the terms of service on a lot of these sites don't really even um, count that as cheating. Like I remember going through it uh, basically when I lived in Rosarito the internet was so bad that it was always in the back of our minds that like sometimes it might go out. And if it does, what will we do? Cause you can't really just be like, all right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll drive to some other place. Like you might miss your whole tournament trying to get to another yeah. place where you could um, get online. So we were looking like what would happen if you called someone you're like, Hey, my friend in Canada um, can log on for my last like 
few tables and like get until I get internet back. Um, and it's not even against terms of service, like or it used to not be where if you um, needed someone to take over your tournament for like a short period of time, it's, it's okay. Or it also said like ghosting, if someone is like giving you some um, tips mid hand, that's <laughs> okay. Like the, I, I'm not even sure what exactly counts as um, being against terms of service or not anymore. It's not really clear. Yeah. It's such a gray area that um, you could just like start making arguments for why it happened. Like clearly this was just really uh, if it's what happened, it's like really um, like a very corrupt version of that, I guess at yeah. best. But I mean, it is, you're right. It's like a super gray area. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I don't know, since we don't know too much more about that situation right now, I'm sure we'll hear more about it. Um, if Bill wants to share, uh, I wanted to get into the stuff that you've been doing. That's been taking up most of your time during the pandemic, um, starting a stable for coaching and backing. Um, I mean, people aren't really doing this much anymore. I feel like a lot of people wrapped up their stables cause they said poker, got harder and like people aren't winning at the rates they used to what inspired you to start one at this point um i think it was like a bunch of different little things together um first of all like i took a test like a year a year and a half ago and it like tells you or supposed to tell you things about your personality it was probably like clickbait on facebook so it really means nothing but um it, it basically said like i like i'm the type of person who would really enjoy teaching and i like figuring things out like puzzles or whatever tinkering with stuff um so like i think the concept of really solving certain aspects of poker all the way down to the most like minute details and then teaching it to people makes a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. um and then also you know corona we had more free time because we were kind of stuck inside and the games have been really really good and i just kind of looked at it, I was me and ashley have been talking about doing this for like a couple of years now we're like we should just pull the trigger it's like the best time ever and getting people in games right now would be great you know for our side of it and it would be if we're ever going to like give it a shot and have a chance of being profitable with it because staking is hard like yeah it'll be now <laughs> and uh so we just kind of went for it and after like two weeks i just stopped playing poker because i was like man i really love teaching people and i really really love sweating people at final tables like way more than I like playing final tables. Um, it's, it's like the pressure's kind of off and you're just so happy for someone else to do well. I don't know, it's a really cool feeling. That's crazy. I feel like I'm the opposite. Like I'm the worst teacher and I'm the worst at, I feel like there's so actually few poker players who are good teachers. So if you can do that, it's like a really special skill. Um, so how do you go about finding people to stake and like is trust like a big issue for you? I went away. I went about it probably the worst way. I just wrote on Twitter like, "Hey, if you're interested and you're at all good at poker, hit me up." <laughs> and I got like, <laughs> I got like four hundred. <laughs> and I tried to start following everyone that that hit me up. And then after like fifty people, I was like, "Never mind." And my friend who's good at internet things made a questionnaire that auto fills out in a spreadsheet, and we started filtering through people, and we got like, it was like a pretty long questionnaire it was meant to filter out people who weren't very serious and we still got like 200 or 250 people and we ended up whittling it down to like not very many 10 or so and uh yeah we just um we we kind of you know we we filtered out people who weren't gonna be full-time after corona because i want to you know if i'm gonna choose someone i'd rather choose someone who's you know all about poker and really wants to put everything into it and we had a few other filters that we found felt were really important, like, you know, trustworthiness and no having mutual friends or something like that helps with that. But really we just wanted people who are like super passionate about poker and want to get better at poker. And we're at least somewhat math oriented, but they're thinking cause I'm like super left brained or whatever. And you know, it, if I'm trying to work with someone who's super right brained, it's just so much harder than, you know, th there's probably better teachers for somebody like that anyways, so who's like a better like live pro type of like, person yeah live pros might be extinct for a while anyway though it seems like i mean i i know the people who thrive from reading people and stuff are having a very hard time right now and then if if poker comes back and it's four-handed for a long time or even six-handed that drastically changes the types of players that you're going to be playing against because like rec players like old man coffees are not going to be pumped about playing shorthanded 
Yeah. So I feel like a lot of live pros are having to transition to trying to be the left brained math people right now too. Yeah. It's interesting watching that happen. Um, I have some friends who are super good at live poker and have just talked trash about like PO solver for four years. And now I just see them on the DTO app and it's really funny. <laughs> and they're like, don't get me wrong. Like they're like way better than me at, at like mid stakes live tournaments. They exploit other regs and fish like way better than me, but you know, they're still playing DTO. <laughs> they're still, they're still trying to like kind of adapt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cause there's nothing like, there's no way that getting better at the fundamentals is going to make you worse at live poker. If those people who are great at live poker, let's say uh, like Chance Corneth, like prides himself on live reads and stuff. If he gets good at DTO, like if he uses that app and gets amazing at that, he'll just be a double threat instead of just being a live reads guy or whatever. So like that always seemed kind of like a cop out if someone says, yeah, I'm not going to check out solvers because I'm just going to read people. I'm like, why not be good at poker, the math side of it too? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, there's, I don't want to like name names, but like, there's definitely guys who are really good at live tells and they just don't talk about it as much because they're also good at the math game. So they just act like they're a math person and then they get away with people kind of relaxing about live stuff mm -hmm. around them because they think they're just like this online math guy. And, uh, I think that's like super threatening, but you don't hear about it as much because most of them are tr not trying to let you know that that's who they are. For sure. Or, or not, not so much like, you know, you, but like the eight people that they play high rollers with or whatever. <laughs> True. Um, um, go ahead. Go ahead I was going to say, uh, you know, obviously you've played a lot of live and online. I think most people know you most famously, obviously from WSOP main, but how would you describe yourself like more of a, you, like an online player or a live player or. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm definitely a live player. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like my brain attacks things from like the math side of it a lot more. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not like absurd where if, if a guy is just never like folding, I'm not going to try to bluff that guy and have like perfect frequencies against him. I'm not like an idiot, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I, I do like, I do tend to like feel like the online guy still in that sense where I attack things from like a more like theory standpoint, because that's just how I sort of like think, I guess. If it, if it doesn't make sense to me logically um, and like, you know, like some sort of math environment, then I have a lot of trouble trying to like implement that because I just don't feel very good about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, uh, since this is kind of a new thing for you and you just started this, uh, what, like six weeks ago or so, um, what have been the biggest adjustments you've had to make from your expectations to reality? And is there anything you regret? Um, about starting a stable is there a day that you wake up and you're like oh, I have like a lot of coaching to do and I want to just not do anything uh, not so far because I think if anything I hit them with way too much coaching at first and so now if I just like I the last few days I've been or not last like the last couple of weeks I've been kind of sick um, and I need like rest from just screaming on Skype a lot and if I just tell them like, Hey, I, I, I'm canceling everything this week, just study amongst yourselves. Like, I feel like people are like, Oh, great. <laughs> We're sick of this guy anyways. <laughs> so like, that's been cool. Um, I, I guess I haven't hit that juncture yet where I don't, I don't like it. Or there's like some issue. I'm sure I could have done a lot of things better and I'm, I'm learning that and trying to tweak it or whatever. And, um, Ashley and Mike are working with it with me on it. So like they're learning the things that they could or could be doing better, or could have done better and they're tweaking it as well. But I mean, all of that's just like kind of the fun of the process, right? Like if you do everything perfectly the first time, like, yeah, you're an awesome human, but like it's not a very fun way to live life. Yeah. You're less of a commitment phobe than me. Cause I like any new project, even with like everything I like doing, as soon as I say yes to something, I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no. Like I'm <laughs> instantly just like, oh no, I'm committing and I'm, I'm like to long-term stuff. I instantly get this like regretful feeling. And then I talk myself back into like, this is what you want to do. This is how you want to spend your time. But that's amazing that you just like went head first into it and right away are just happy doing it. Yeah. I think part of that is like, I spent a decent chunk of my life saying yes to way too much stuff. Cause I just want to like try a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a, some of these, like this can't be a worse decision than some of my past decisions. So <laughs> by compare, I'm sure we all have that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you like actively try to like 
select what you say yes to these days? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I also have like, I guess when I was doing that, I was, I was living in different places more and just like trying different things and, um, sort of taking in different cultures and stuff. So it made more sense to just say yes to a lot of things. And now that I've been in one place for a long time and I have like people in my life that are very solid and around for a long time, it's like, I, I feel more secure in saying no to stuff. Cause I want to spend more time with those people and, you know, do more of the things that we already do. Um, but yeah. like, yeah, I think, I think yeah. more we could probably say yes a little bit more because we're all um, kind of rigid. It sounds like Jamie says yes a lot anyway. She just. I feel like she does too. I know she does. <laughs> I have a lot of stuff I do, but I, I like, I definitely say yes to a lot of stuff. I do a lot of commentary and jobs and things like that. But just recently I said no to something I really want to do. I wrestled with it for like a week and then just realized it was something. Um, it was a podcast uh, that was about sports betting and like fantasy sports and stuff like that. It's oh, something yeah. I want to know a lot about. I want to get into it really bad. Um, but the, every day I thought about messaging, like I had had a bunch of messages back and forth. Every day I woke up and wanted to say yes. And I was like, I feel like a fraud. This is something I want to learn about. Like I should be listening to a podcast about sports betting. I shouldn't be podcasting about it. Even if they put it with an expert, I'm going to sound like a fool if I try to talk about this thing I know nothing about. And like, finally I just said no, because it, it had that feeling of like, once I say yes to this, I'm going to regret it. I'm going to feel like sick about having to do it. Um, yeah, but that's enough about me. I wanted to ask you, I was like, speaking of saying yes. Um, so you asked Ashley to marry you about last year. Or so, were you sweating uh, that one? A little longer than that. A little longer than that. <laughs> were you sweating that one? What was that Maybe like? Aussie millions ago. Oh wow! Wow, it's been that long. <laughs> oh man, we're old. Yeah. Mm. But in my defense, we've basically been married for like six years, anyways. So true. But like that's that. This is a good story. This is like this can give poker players hope. Poker players who have mostly male friends um, who do nerdy things like play magic and poker games and things like that. But you nabbed Ashley Sleeth, who is uh, one of my favorite people and a very awesome girl. And she just won like 80K on ACR. So now she's your sugar mom. Yes. Um, how do you do that? Give guys instructions for how to meet girls like Ashley. Well, there's really only one Ashley, so it's kind of hard. Oh, um, <laughs> good answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, say yes to a lot of things and then, you know, stick with one of them. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> I feel like I'm a pretty lucky person. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Like I've been fairly lucky in my life. So this, you could maybe chalk that one up to this as well. Like, I think I played pretty well in terms of that sort of thing, but like certainly uh, like the, the way I met Ashley is so insane. Like I, um, my friend got her number uh, at like this, like basically like a rock show, whatever party thing. And they were going on a date to the beach and then he happened to crash at my house or my mom's house. Like I was home visiting my, my family and he happened to crash with me at the house that night. And so me and my other friend gave him a ride to the beach. Ashley saw me in the car was like, Oh, I better bring a friend too." like brought her friend. And then at some point throughout like the next 14 hours of us hanging out, like decided that she liked me more and her friend liked my friend more. Wow. But like, <laughs> the fact that he like crashed in my house, like, you know what I mean? It's just like so many things had to go right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. It's like from Harry, when Harry met Sally shit, that's what happens. They go on a double date and then they switch. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Did your I, friend I mean, end up dating that girl too? They dated for like a month, but then when summer ended, you know, they, they, they parted ways. And when so, and this is like the part of like me playing, playing good or whatever is like when summer ended, Ashley was like, uh, I'm going to go to Spain because mm. I've never, she had just finished college and she's like, I've never left the country. Like I'm going to go to Spain. My, for my graduation present, my parents gave me tickets to Spain and uh, I studied Spanish. So I'm going to go. And I was like, cool. And she's like, you want to come? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, wait, what do you do that you can just like come to Spain for like a couple of months? I was like, no, don't worry about it. And then That's she learned awesome. poker. Everything was great. <laughs> Dude, that's an amazing story. You are a lockbox, and you get second in the WSP main. Oh, you, give me a time worse. in your life. Yeah, but I want a time in your life when you've been unlucky. I want to hear some story where it's like the other side of the coin. Um, I mean, I had these guys move down the street next to us that uh, their dog's always stealing my dog. And... <laughs> 
Listen, that's another mm-hmm. lockbox thing. I moved down the street and then your dog who gets abused by the other dog has a best friend in Crouton. That's it's really too. amazing. <laughs> it's really lovely for her. When we, uh, Marley, when we leave the house now, if, uh, if like both dogs aren't together, if she's alone, she knows where she's going and she immediately starts like choking on her leash and just like dragging me down the street. It's really cute. You guys are the greatest. Um, um, obviously, so obviously Ashley plays too and has been crushing. Tell us about like your poker relationship. Do you guys talk a lot of hands or do you find it hard to kind of do that as a couple? Yeah, it's, we kind of went back and forth on that a little bit because so when we started, she didn't, she didn't plan to be a professional poker player or anything. I feel like I, next time we do this, if we ever do this again, we need to get her up here. Like, yeah. For sure. <laughs> anyways. Um, I feel like when we first started doing it. So, so basically what happened was after we traveled through Spain, she was like, well, what do we do now? And I was like, come live in Vegas. And so she came to Vegas and all of a sudden we went from me never talking about poker at all to like all my friends and I talk about is poker and it's like its own language. And so she pulled me aside one day and was like, yo, like I don't need to play poker, but you need to teach me this game because I'm not just going to sit around and not understand what you're talking about. Like, mm-hmm. I fucking love like, that, man. I feel like there's so many, girlfriends who like and like it's fine but like so many our, our, our spouses in general would just like have zero knowledge like years into a relationship of like mm-hmm. even like flush beats straight and stuff and like yeah. it's kind of like you, don't you feel like you want to be in the loop a little bit i don't know anyways continue <laughs> no I, I totally agree i i find that really weird too and yeah. it's like if i talk about poker at dinner like ashley will still roll her eyes but like she's yeah. rolling her eyes because like why are we talking about work you know what i mean at least it's yeah. that and not, I don't know. I, I, I'm with you though. I don't, I don't get spending years with someone and not knowing a little bit about their like greatest interest slash job. Totally. Yeah. I think some people do it like that on purpose. Like I think some people engineer it that way so that they have like two separate lives. So they're like, here's my work life and I leave it at work. And when I go home, I don't ever talk about it or think about it. Like some people definitely do that because their jobs are stressful and they suck and they want to like, their commute home is when they forget about it and then they go home to their husband or wife and they're like, okay, let's talk about anything else. But I've never been like that. Like I've, I, ever since I started playing um, full time, I've basically only had like long-term relationships with poker players because I think it's weird. I, like, I don't know. It's such a part of your life that you should probably be able to like share it with that person or else you're just kind of, I don't know, you go home and just like what stuff that all down inside of you, how you did that day or how you're feeling. Um, Seems impossible. Mm-hmm. I um I, I was always jealous of cultures like the Japanese culture is very much like this, a few others. Um we're very much like our personality isn't defined by our job. And there are some cultures where a lot of the jobs or professions or whatever you want to call them are like a like a piece of life work where they get better at some sort of craft for years and years and years. And um that like takes on like their personality, like that becomes a big part of it. And I don't know, to me like anything I'm working on is like a big part of my personality because I'm going to work on something I'm passionate about. So that it never made sense to me how people do that, but I mean, it's fine. Like I'm not, I'm not like judging them or anything. So, so yeah. So then she is in Vegas and she's just like, Hey, I want to learn this game somewhat. And so you, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So then I started teaching her and by the way, she's like, at this point she, she did, she was dancing for a living, but um, she was like part of this dance, this uh, modern dance company out of, Texas. Um, and she would fly out there, but I mean, dance pays like minimum wage. So she had, uh, she was working at Victoria's secret actually at, uh, at the mall in, um, planet Hollywood. And she hated it. Like she liked the people that she worked with, but she hated working there. And, uh, so as soon as she was beating sit and goes for like five bucks an hour or something, she quit her job. (laughs) That's enough. (laughs) But uh, probably yeah. she was probably working and making what, like 15 bucks an hour or something. It's like, dude, that makes sense. Actually, once you can beat poker for like close to what you're doing in a retail job, yeah. then, like stay at home. <laughs> Hello there. It's time for some plugs for our sponsors at Run It Once. As many of you may already know, the weekly Legends Rewards program on Run It Once Poker allows players to earn up to 75% total rake back. But what you may not know 
is that right now we're doubling down on that offer and matching 100% of any Legends rewards you earn this week. If you want to see all the juicy details, go to once.run slash double. And, as usual, if you're looking to improve your game, hop on over to Run It Once Training, where you can learn from a massive library of content from an enviable selection of top professionals like Mr. Phil Galfond. And if you sign up through once.run slash learn, you'll receive free access to three of their elite level videos. Now, let's get back to that pod. We have it really good in poker and we kind of lose track of that because when you're focused on getting better at something, you know, like your win rate just becomes sort of like a score almost. But when you compare it to going and getting a real job, especially a like a retail real job, at, mm-hmm. you know, like the bottom of the totem pole, I mean, it's just like crazy how good we have it. Um, That's why it's like, I think so hard for like people who kind of lose interest in poker to enter the real world again. It's, it's like... You know, where else are you going? I mean, yeah, it's just, but they don't, they can't go to work and lose. So I guess, you know, it's a give and take. But. That's that, that was actually one of the biggest um, kind of like blew my mind thoughts ever was I realized just how risk averse people were. Uh, I started looking into, it was like when I started listening to more podcasts with angel investors and thinking about um, tech, like investing in tech, um, VC investing, whatever. And I was like, these, I mean, I, you could say different things about it, but clearly uh, some of the highest ROIs you could possibly achieve in any sort of investment are in tech, but they're also the most volatile investments. And I was like, why don't more people invest in these? They just, in this sort of stuff, sorry, these, um, it makes, you can make so much money. I was yeah. like, oh, people are super risk averse. And I started watching these videos where, I don't know if you guys have seen that video where this guy will flip a coin with someone. And if, if uh, he wins or if the other guy wins, he'll give him $10. And he's like, but if you lose, you have to give me $9. And they're like, no. And so he starts like <laughs> upping how much he'll give them. And he gets to like a hundred to one ratio and people won't do it because they don't want to lose a dollar. And uh, it's like, do I just, think it's a scam. Like, I think maybe I would say no. Cause I'd be like, okay, guy on the street. No, thanks. <laughs> but he's like, he's got yeah. like a cameraman with him and stuff. It's like, this guy, oh, is this guy really going to like run away from you? Like with, with the cameraman, like, I don't know. Maybe they do think that, but either way, it just showed how risk averse people really are. And also, I guess you could equate that with like, they have all these talk TV shows where they pick like the dumbest person on any given True. block and like ask them about like a world map or something. Yeah. Um, obviously like they're not getting the average human <laughs> when they, when they uh, leave the cutting room floor. But yeah. I do think that that risk aversion causes a lot of people to miss out on massive, massive opportunities in their life. Like think about all the people that have a good idea and if they just went for it and started a business, they might have, you know, tons of success with it in a bunch of different ways. And they just don't do it because having a job with some insurance is pretty good. It's like you could just give up six to 12 months of that and go for it and maybe go back to that job or find another job. But people really hate, um, I guess, like the downside of what could happen. I wonder I think if people that really will thought change. about the worst. What's that? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I wonder if that will change um, based on what just happened to everyone, right? Like there are people who thought they had stable jobs for a decade or more. Um, and those stable jobs either disappeared or they treated them crappy and just like tossed all their workers out um, yeah. or whatever. Like sometimes even the things that we think are stable are not. So then maybe you need to value things differently and realize that like some risks that seem very risky aren't that much worse than like depending on an employer. Yeah, definitely. We may see huge shifts in how people operate after this. Um, I've always kind of found that funny that people thought it was so weird that I would gamble for a living. And I'm like, you know, you're every day you're risking you don't get fired at your job. Or if you have your own company, you know, that's a big risk too. Like, and, and I think as poker players, we all talk about that concept. But it, yeah, it is basically, I didn't really think about that, but this just brought to light uh, that whole concept for another. 300 million people in the U S or whatever. Cause what are we, we're like 20,000 people. And then the non poker player community is 300 million. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Except for during the pandemic, I think some of those guys crossed over at least to an app game. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many random people trying out poker because 
I think that never went away, that lingering feeling of like, I'd like to play online poker, right? Like when Black Friday happened, I still think it had been a goal of certain people that they wanted to build up some money at online poker and quit their job one day. And like getting poker taken away didn't take that dream away, but they're coming back to a a landscape of online poker that just sucks, you know, like compared to how it used to be. It's weird because this is as good as probably it's going to get. Like we, we have this crazy um, like peak that we haven't seen in like five years and how many people are playing and traffic, just traffic online. Yeah. And it's still nowhere near what it was in 2012 or 2011 or whatever. It just won't be because people are getting better. Yeah. But I mean, you got to take that for what it's worth. Everything gets tougher. Margins always get thinner in every industry. People are smart and they figure out what's good to do and then they go do it. Yeah. Well, well, you didn't, we didn't hear from you. Are you a, are you a, a yes type of person? You don't strike me as a person who says no all the time. Well, it's funny because when, I, I've known Jesse for a while and uh, Jamie, I, we kind of met post post my vlog. And when I came up with my vlog, I guess, and become, because I was just some random like grinder, like sitting in the corner, right, for like ever. And then I put my vlog and I was kind of getting more offers to do commentary and podcasts and whatever it may be. And for the first year, you know, I did try in, I did all these things and like, I literally said yes to everything, like every fucking thing that someone asked me to do, I would do paid or unpaid, like, you know, tons of stuff. And like, I kind of like hit a wall, I hit a wall and I kind of started to just sort out things I like and things I don't like, um, as much. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, like I do enjoy this, but whatever. So now I think I just have like a better idea in the poker scope of things. Um, I think it's fine to like do everything and then kind of narrow it down. But at this point I'm very like selective because I just have some, like a better idea of like what I'm interested in that in the jobs I've had that I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm it. you know, they say when you go into business, the best thing to do is be a yes person for a little while at least, and then start yeah. adding in those. But if you're just known as a person who gets stuff done and, um, yeah, you know, we'll go on that podcast or whatever. It's, it's yeah. really helpful for your brand or for whatever you're doing. There's wear and tear though. Like, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I'm not getting offers to like every day, whatever, but there's a certain point where you like burn yourself out and you run yourself so ragged that like, it's just not, it's just not worth it kind of, do you know what I sure. mean? And so I guess, uh, you know, I, I guess like I always kind of felt like, especially when it came to like money to money stuff too. Like I never wanted to be so like, oh, well, like that's not enough money. So like whatever, so I would just do everything free or not. And so I'm kind of always worried about like, I don't want to say no and like come off like I'm too good for that or whatever. But I also, is it really worth my time? So it's just, I don't know. It's just constant, constant battle. But, uh, the thing I do say no to a lot too is social things. I feel like I'm very selective of like, I'm not going to just go to like every random like birthday party, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. That I, I, I've never been good at that. And yeah. fortunately, Ashley is like my yang. Yeah. My yang or whatever, because I'll invite literally everyone in the hallway at WSOP to dinner. Yeah. And then Ashley will step in and be like, you know, not that one person. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. That was a good call. And then we go to dinner with everyone with that one person. <laughs> I love that Ashley's the sneaky mean person. That's amazing. Yeah, but she's not like it's, just more like yeah. it's like sneaky, like necessary filter, if anything. Yeah. <laughs> like that one person should not have come. I kinda am like that for Chris. Chris is the like of of people who have been his friends forever, he'll just be like, "Yeah, you know, maybe I'll back that guy." And I'm like, "Not that guy." <laughs> <laughs> well, backing is a whole other animal. But yeah, like, even just like going to dinner is like, you know, I mean, because you just like get invited to a lot of shit or whatever. And like, if you went to every like get together and every party every night, it would be like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's during WSOP. I mean, I wish I had those problems now. Of like figuring out what social events to go to or not but I think that does actually happen every summer where that's when everything is happening like everyone is doing fun stuff and like everyone's just trying to get groups together to go out and whatever and like that's when you have to be really selective because you're also spending all your money on tournaments and things and like 
trying to figure out at that point what if it's worth it to go to top golf that night or is it worth it to go to a pool party when you're trying to grind every single day but now i'm saying it i feel sad <laughs> i wish we had that problem right now i know yeah um Jesse, what what like big event that got canceled are you most missing out on? Not poker or non poker. Um, like are you like an are you like a Burning Man EDC kind of guy? Or I can't remember. I've never been to Burning Man. I went to EDC once. I actually really wanted to go to Burning Man when I found out some friends from home mm-hmm. were going last year, but I didn't really pull it off. They, uh, I just like my friends from home are very like woodsy and campy and. Um, like when I go home, I just like go fishing with one of my friends, like basically every single day. And yeah. so they were all coming out. And I was like, Oh man, like that's kind of like my people that I like, you know, do the, do the nature type of stuff with. And, um, I don't know if I should go into this, but like, if I've ever tried certain things that open up your mind a little bit, it was with those people. <laughs> so like, I, I was really excited to do that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I don't know, like I, when I missed out on that, I was like a little bit sad, but normally I don't really do that much of that. We, we did EDC one year and we couldn't find a three day ticket. And I was devastated because it was the first time I was going to do it. And we went the first night because we got a one day ticket. And I was like, thank God we didn't find a three day ticket. I was destroyed. So yeah, I think, too old I think that shit. I'm like a party <laughs> animal and in reality, I'm just like an old person. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. Like we had talked about it with us just like all going EDC and it was always like, which day are we going to go? I'm like I can do one day and then I take like three days to just lay around and be like drink water and pretend I didn't just ruin my brain and body for the whole entire day. But the people who go for like Burning Man, I don't even understand it. I don't know how they live through it because <laughs> what what I'm picturing is just like EDC for seven days straight, but plus a bunch of drugs I probably don't even know about. Yeah, and I just think okay. that seems like too and no much. showers. Yeah, well, yeah, that's <laughs> that's something else. I've had a lot of people describe um, Burning Man to me in like the thing that they find the most valuable about it is how everyone shares things and how there's like this community sort of thing around it. And where I came, like where I grew up, was a very small, isolated place, and it was very community driven. And when I go home, there's lots of like friends and families doing like potlucks or like my friend organizes like these. Um, meetings at this town hall and people just go up and play music and stuff. Um, and like people bring food or whatever. So it's like, there's a lot of that where I grew up anyways. And so whenever people described it to us, Ashley is always like, you know, you should just visit like where Jesse grew up. Like they have that going on all year round. So like that kind of stuff, I never felt like I missed out on. I'm actually like kind of fired up to not have world series. I mean, I, I, I don't get me wrong. I would definitely do World Series and I'll, I'm going to miss World Series. But like having an excuse to not be in Vegas in the dead of summer is kind of nice. Um, yeah. I if don't they know. move World Series in the fall for the rest of our lives, it would probably be like one of the top 10. Yeah, but life. we live here anyway. That's like that's where I'm, I'm dying because I've only been out here for two years. And I just said for the couple years before that, I'm like, why don't I live in Vegas? I come out here for the shittiest time of the year every year when it's 110, you melt in the parking lot on the way to the Rio. And then I'm not here when it's nice out. But now we're here and there's no poker. So I'm just living in a desert for no (laughs) reason. (laughs) I mean, at least you're in the desert right now and it's perfect outside. Yeah, it's supposed to be 110 later this week, though. Uh, (laughs) You got an RV. You could always take a little trip north or (laughs) east or south or whatever yeah not that far west yeah um so i wanted to just give you one last question since you're saying yes to everything and you all have all these plans let's say that poker at some point like your stable's running itself um you get to play poker when you want you don't ever have to play if you don't want to uh what is your next biggest business um goal do you have some uh part of some market you want to get into do you have some app you want to build or an invention do you know what you want to do in like 10 years I actually know what I want to do in like 10 weeks, but I'm working on it right now and I can't really, I don't really want to talk about it until it's like done so that somebody else doesn't also start working on it. Um, don't worry. It's just between us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll come back and talk about it. All right. Something. Fair enough. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I have a lot of things I'd like to do and I'd like to do like work on projects outside of poker eventually because that would be fun too. Yeah. Cool. Marley, what about you? I feel like I, I don't catch up with you. Usually when we had it in person, 
um marley would come over and we'd pretend we're starting the podcast a certain time yeah. and then we'd talk for two hours um and then we'd start the podcast so yeah. i don't have that like catch up time anymore so yeah. what is your big plan do you have like vlog plans or anything cool on the horizon so i had my my blog series that i had started filming but it's it's not really poker related and it's about me pursuing other jobs and so obviously i have to film it outside of my house so i had to put that on hold um, but then I made this silly like mock TV commercial of like this is your brain on drugs. And I, it was just like a fluke one time thing. And that was great by the way, sorry to interrupt, but I really like that. That was very you. nostalgic. And, and I had a lot of fun doing it and, uh, the feedback was like really positive actually. Um, so I was, so I've been doing more little like one minute videos, like similar vein type stuff. So I'm going to continue to make those kind of videos and then stream on Twitch. You know, I'm enjoying that, uh, just building that audience and like, you know, getting some kind of, I feel like I always just feel like if I grind and I just have like an eight hour session and I like get destroyed, but I like had this big audience and I grew my channel and everyone was like watching. It's like, I feel kind of productive at the end of it. I don't kind of feel like. Jesus Christ, I just bricked everything. Like, even if I bricked, it's like I did something or I don't know. So I enjoy it. I enjoy it. But yeah. yeah it's like a social rake back. Social rake back. Yeah. And like, <laughs> that's kind of the thing with the vlogs too is like, you kind of, sometimes, sometimes with poker, you can kind of feel like you're lighting hours on fire when you're just grinding away. But, but uh, when you do creative stuff, it kind of is rewarding. So, gotcha. But yeah. Um, so leave us with some some uh, nugget of wisdom, Jesse. Do you have a nugget of wisdom for us poker players as a, a parting little well, fortune well, cookie? Yeah. <laughs> and like, what do you tell like you, you're when you're coaching someone? What's like one of the what's like your first thing you tell them? Or what would first you first thing I tell them? Yeah. Don't steal money from Jesse. <laughs> it's a good first rule. Nice. There was actually a. a I'm really into Rick and Morty and, and he has like a bunch of kids and they're leaving them forever. And he's like, don't call me for money. <laughs> That's like his parting wisdom. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't know what kind of nuggets you're looking for here, but anything, like, anything. This is the most open-ended question of all time. Give us wow. a nugget of wisdom. I don't know. P pick a topic, Marley, spin the wheel. Um, big role management. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure like 40 people have said this before, but whatever you think your bankroll should be for a stake, it should be like five times that. And if you're not that good at bankroll management, it should be like 40 times that. But variance and if, is crazy. And if you're a losing player, then you just need infinite. That That's like one thing that always gets <laughs> lost in the shuffle there. And people are like, how many buy-ins do you need at 2.5? I'm like, do you win? <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking how many buy-ins does a person need at 2-5 or are we yeah. talking about how many buy-ins do you need at 2-5? <laughs> Burn. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Variance is pretty pretty rough. People don't realize it until it's... In the tournament, really dude, tournament variance, trust me, I'm relatively new to like playing a lot of high-volume tournaments. Woo, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I've been actually running pretty good to start, so I'm lucky, but like, I just kind of know from Spraggy and other tournament players, like what I have to look forward to. And I'm just like, okay. Like I go like three days and I'll like lose three days in a row. And I'm like, what's going on? Cause like in cash, if you lose three days in a row, like get crushed, you're just like, what the fuck's going on? This shouldn't mm -hmm. be happening. For the tournaments, it's like, oh yeah, buckle up for three months of this. <laughs> and then we'll talk. It makes you I realize how you sick it is that we expect to have like winning years every year in live tournaments too. Yeah. Cause like clearly, I mean, you're going to play what? two days worth of tournament online tournaments in a year of live tournaments Dude, live tournaments to me now seem so ridiculous it's like it's insane i actually and also like just live tournaments in general like uh everyone like says to me in my, in my twitch thing like oh why are you playing so low whatever because you know i started off playing like five to ten dollar tournaments online because i was like i don't know what i'm doing like i'm just gonna start off slow and like I know they're tougher and I played my first 530 this weekend. And I was like, I think I got a bad table though, but I was like, this is as tough as like a 5k live and like that I've played. Oh, yeah. Like this is way tougher than like 5ks. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Like, and people, 
And I don't know. It, it really put in perspective how soft a lot of tournaments can be, especially in WSOP. Like, you know, a lot of those are just so, so soft. So there's only two good reasons to play tournaments in general, especially live tournaments. And there's like 80 to play 80 good reasons to play live cash or online cash or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, the only things that are good about tournaments is that they're soft and it feels really, really good when you actually win one or, you know, chop one or something. Yeah. And you kind of love what you can lose in a way. Like I feel like if you're like 400 big wines deep in cash, you can just lose infinite. But like if you're, you know, if you know, like if you stay like disciplined to the average buy-in you're playing in tournaments, you're only going to lose so much. And you can, yeah, I think that's a good reason. I think for new, new people and people yeah. who are doing it for fun, like, um, when I was a lawyer still, I really, I enjoyed playing cash games, but the random tournament that I had time to play and even online tournaments, those felt fun. There's like, there's competition and there's glory if you win. And you also, there's a stop loss. It didn't used to be a uh, re-entry up until you're at the final table like it is now. Um, so you really would just go and be like, I'm, I'm playing a $500 tournament. It's going to cost me $500 and that's it. And I've allotted that much out of my life bowl to play. So I think that's good for people. But yeah, I've seen you go insane online. I'm watching it in slow motion, Marley, um, on Instagram stories where she's just like, oh, I'm just playing. This tournament's really fun. <laughs> and then she gets a set of jacks on a queen jack x and the person is like king queen and she loses whatever that one was and literally she just stared like she stops dancing and was just like staring <laughs> and it was for a really uncomfortable amount of time you know and what? i i knew that feeling very well <laughs> well you know what's frustrating is like what's frustrating is you're never like you're never like comfortable in a tournament like if you're up like 500 big blinds in a cash game and you like like you're probably not going to leave like a loser, but in a, in a tournament like that tournament specifically, I literally was mashing literally for all day one. And it was middle of day two. And I had a hundred big blinds plus the whole fucking time. And then I just get in this massive pot for like one of the chip leads and just fucking like runner runner, like just out. And I'm just like, I was just like astonished because I had like I thought I was just sitting pretty like oh I'm just gonna coast into the final table like I'm just I'm mm. there like oh I'm there I'm I can't lose like and then just out and then other days you have 20 bigs for the whole tournament and you win it and you never have more than 20 bigs it's just crazy it's just fucking crazy but yeah oh I can't so wait to see what content you're gonna produce when you really lose your mind like oh. I'm telling you, because you you make some good shit already, but when tournaments really like infect your brain and your brain is like Swiss cheese, <laughs> you're going to come out with some out of line vlogs. They're going to be amazing. Thank so you. Look forward to that at least. Thank you. By the way, like going out of your mind is such a good recipe for poker social media. Like, I, I mean, obviously, but like it, the best Twitch streamers by far are the ones who just wear their heart completely on their sleeve. And every time they take a bet. Like, you know how there's most Twitch streamers trying to like, I mean, I try to do it when I was streaming on Twitch, like act cool and be like, oh yeah, I never care when I lose, not a big deal. And then you have like three of them that are just like, motherfucker. And it's like, those are the people I want to watch. Yeah. You know? Oh those yeah. Are- but like genuine, like I, I don't really put on either. Like the, I will literally, sometimes I'll sit there and I won't say a word for 20 minutes. I'm just sitting there and I'm just grinding. Like you can fucking make your own inferences of why I'm doing it. I don't feel like talking for 20 minutes. I'm just like, do, do, do. But then like other times I'm, I think as long as it's natural, but I think a lot of sometimes streamers like feel like they have to put on a show and that, that also is like cringy to me. So sure. I don't get the feeling. I mean, I haven't like, you know, watched all your stuff or anything, but I don't get the feeling like you're ever putting on a show though. So if you are like, thanks, no, probably yeah. you're able to pull it off. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Yeah. And I know Jamie doesn't put on a show because I've heard her talk about poker when she's not on stream or anything. And it's the <laughs> exact same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, oh, that's, yeah. that's a nugget right there. If you can have some sort of poker side hustle, like mm-hmm. not, not like hustle, I guess, but like, like you play cash games on the side or you grind sit and goes or something that keeps you at least even while you're on tournament downswings, which is most of your tournament career. Mm-hmm. Um, because you basically peak and then you have another downswing. Uh, do it because your mental stability when you're deep in a tournament is so important. And just not having that thing in the back of your head, it's like, I need seventh to be like even on my downswing is so, so massive. You can be the sickest robot 
poker player or whatever. And I still think that that would have like some small effect on your subconscious. I a hundred percent agree with that, especially, uh, so during the pandemic, as soon as it started, I just played every single day because it felt like every single day was amazing. Um, and I realized on like day 35 or something that this is kind of a sick attitude to have and that I should probably chill because I'm starting to play really bad. Um, and just being able to step aside from that and, and work on little things that also earned me some money and also work on other things that for the future are setting me up for the, for my like poker hours to be more profitable. That was amazing. And I think uh, back in the day when I was just loving poker so much, you couldn't pull me away. On day 35, I'd be like, I'm playing really bad. I'd be like, wake up the next day, be like, I want to play again. Uh, yeah. And I think that that is a great nugget of wisdom, though, to just have other things that will either make you money or make you a better player that you can step back from actually playing the game when you feel like you're not playing your best and take a break. It's it's always great to have that confidence where you're like, like let's say on the final table bubble, you feel like this running this big bluff would be great against like the chip leader or whatever. But if you bust, you're out. Or I mean, if you if you bust, you're definitely out. If you uh, get called, you're out. And it's like having that confidence, like whatever, fuck it, I can just go back and grind cash games tomorrow is huge. Uh, it's like really, really. I've never been a. We've talked about this before, Jamie, but like I've never been a back against the wall type of guy. Uh, I all my like good runs and success have always come when, you know, I could take it or leave it. And I, I have friends who just, when they're down to their last buy-in, they just always seem to get there. And that's not me. Like when times are tough, like I need to go grind cash or something. I'm not like going to bake a tournament and I'm not going to just like have a massive cash game session or something. It's going to be like slow and steady. Um, but You're in a great spot now too. Cause now you have a rich fiance too. <laughs> taken down these like ACR birds left and right. Like you literally never will have your back against the wall. You could just go play a tournament and win. You're like, eh, who cares? Like this is your yeah, new attitude. Basically, uh, nice. basically put a baby in Oprah. <laughs> Crushing it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I got a little Jamie to me. Spending a lot of time around Jamie. I got like I got references and puns now. <laughs> That'll happen. I'm good at this. Um, anyways, we'll let you, we'll, uh, let you go. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank yeah, you guys. Of course. I hope you don't have the coronavirus, <laughs> especially cause we like hang out. This is my, like my quarantine friend. I have like two friends and a dog. The only people I hang out with. Jesse's like, my chest is starting to feel really tight. And my throat hurts. And I'm like, please God. <laughs> no. Um, I won't do it here cause it's probably not that fun, but, uh, I'll give you a rundown on all of my symptoms. I, feel pretty confident that I don't have it unless I just getting like the weirdest version of symptoms ever. Um, I think it's probably some sort of like allergy type of. Yeah. could just be from putting in like 80 action. hours of coaching a week. That might be it. Could be. I might but just anyway. be a <laughs> joke and I can't even talk for more than two and a half hours without dying. <laughs> well, we'll let you go take a nap, sleep off the last of this coronavirus that you have picked up. Um, All right. But yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we'll have Ashley on at another time and she could just talk a bunch of shit about you. You are nice. We'll have yeah. you first and then we'll have her rebuttal. <laughs> Mine's going to be like, oh man, how lucky was I to meet Ashley? And hers is going to be like, he still hasn't cleaned those dishes. <laughs> yeah, she's going to be like, listen, so let me tell you the story of how I settled for Jesse. Um, <laughs> poor Jesse. Anyway, I couldn't be nice to you the whole pod. You were pretty nice considering what you say to my face when we're not on this. <laughs> you, you pick the nice versions of things. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. Feel better. And uh, yeah, hopefully no more scandals this week to talk about, Marley. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as always, guys, we'll see you next week. Peace. Bye. Take care.